So welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. We have uh, many people coming from more than 20 different countries today. So we are very happy to hosting this, this event. Um, you can introduce yourself if you want through the chat. Um, tell where are you visiting us. Um, for example, I'm from Barcelona, Spain. We have people that will be talking today from Brazil, um, United States, Nepal. So it's a very big and international event. Um, having said that, I wanted to do a really brief introduction of um, transforming tourism initiatives. I'm Carla Izcara, a member of Alba Sud. And now I'm moderating this event that we are organizing with the Transforming Tourism Initiative that if anyone doesn't know the, the net yet, I invite you to visit our website. Um, today we are organizing this uh, webinar called the Unseen Majority that it's apart from different seminaries that will take place um, during the next month. Um, we, today we we will be talking about women um, working in the informal economy inside the tourism sector. And the next session we will be talking also about um, informal informal work, informal sector, and how the this work is organized. So um, with no more delay and to have time to present all the panelists today. Um, today we have Sonia Diaz with us that will be the first panelist um, speaking. Sonia Diaz is a sociologist by training with the PhD in political science on the role of participatory governments in inclusive solid waste management in Brazil. She is a WIGO Global Waste Specialist, that WIGO is a woman in informal employment, globalizing and organizing. And she now lives in Brazil and does global as well as local work with informal waste workers for more than 35 years. And she will doing uh, this kind of introduction to the informal sector with this gender perspective. So very happy to have you here and can't wait to listen to you. Thank you, Sonia. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are in your uh, geography. It's a pleasure to be here. I really look forward to this conversation and uh, particularly to learn about informal workers in the tourism industry, which is something that I haven't been following. So I'm very uh, eager to learn from you guys. Uh, so let me quickly introduce you to WIGO. WIGO is a global action and research and policy, uh, pardon me, uh, network that whose goal is to improve the status of the working poor, uh, especially women. And we do that through increased organization representation of workers in the informal economy, through improved statistics and research, uh, advocating and supporting workers towards more inclusive policy processes, and through more equitable trade, labor, urban planning, and social protection policies. Uh, just to set the ground, uh, we know that employment is the hinge that connects three key transformations at the center of uh, economic uh, development, living standards, productivity, and social cohesion. And when we think about uh, development, we are already familiar with the discussion around the need to go beyond uh, development as a synonym of modernization or economic growth and industrialization, but actually uh, have a notion of development uh, in which the expansion of people's capabilities, what they can 
or cannot do when they're functioning, what they actually do or do not do as Amartya Sen has uh, conceptualized development. Uh, we, we know that this is central and for Wigo, livelihoods is at the center of our uh, work. And it is why for us, we, uh, our work, our founders, uh, they uh, favored the term of employment because of this understanding that this term captures both uh, self-employment and wage employment. And this understanding that actually uh, employment is actually done at the informal economy uh, in the majority of uh, the world cities. And that's why we depart from a notion of informal economy that refers to informal economy as income generating activities that operate outside the regulatory framework of the state and the work that our founders did in the early uh, days of uh, Wigo's foundation was around working with the ILO to have a definition that could uh, center on, on an understanding of the informal economy as incorporating both operators and workers in informal firms, as well as those that are in the formal sector firms, but have unprotected or irregular work. So uh, for us, social protection, uh, protection of work is central. Uh, so around the world, we see informal workers in working on the streets or in open spaces, such, such as way speakers that the sector that I work with, uh, informal tourist workers, construction workers, and others, workers who work under informal uh, conditions at home, like the home-based workers who produce for the industry uh, from their homes under informal conditions, people who work in homes of others, like domestic workers, people working in hotels, restaurants and offices, like dishwashers, helpers, uh, people working in small workshops, such as scrap metal re uh, 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 recycler shops, uh, garment makers, and people working in unregulated factories. factories. Uh, it's important for us to have in mind three key facts. First is what I had uh, uh, mentioned already. The majority of, of the total workforce in developing countries is informally employed. Uh, our work with the ILO, our statistic program together with the ILO, they, you know, they estimate that 50 to 90 percent of the total workforce is informally employed. The other fact that is important for us to bear in mind is that the working poor tend to be concentrated in informal employment where on average earnings are low and risks are high. And a third fact that is important to bear in mind is that women are more likely than men to be engaged in informal employment in most countries. And uh, also that they are concentrated in the more precarious types of informal employment. When we look at statistic data from Brazil, for instance, we can see that in our highest uh, database for uh, uh, informal, for formal workers, those who are way speakers, uh, the majority for, uh, of uh, way speakers employed as formal are men, not women. Uh, just a bit of a sector group statistics. 
uh, our uh, analysis have shown that 18% of the urban workforce in India, home-based workers, for street vendors, the share of total non-agricultural employment ranges between two to 9%. Uh, in the African cities, it can be as high as 20%. Way speakers, uh, we know that about one to two percent of urban employment in, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, are employed as way speakers. So, what our statistics analysis suggests is that the informal work, rather than being the exception, is the dominant mode of work in towns and cities in the developing world. And yet, you know, our economy and our cities are planned for uh, you know, former workers and not the other way around. But we need to uh, make it clear that statistic, the, the statistical uh, picture is patchy. Uh, we have uh, issues regarding the national stat agents that don't have consistent definitions on what is urban. Uh, sector group details is often not reported and in some cases not even gathered. And data is gathered in ways that city level disaggregation is not possible. So it's very critical that we improve uh, statistics uh, to make inclusive planning more effective. It's important for us to have an understanding how cities are built towards ex exclusionary policies. We have dominant narratives which stigmatize informal workers as being non-compliant, of having low productivity, of being associated with crime, with dirt, with congestion, and in the sense of the policy and laws that we have are more very often punitive towards the self-employed workers. And so we have commercial laws that are biased uh, towards formal firms. We have sector laws biased towards formal firms and administrative law. Uh, which does not uh, uh, speak to the needs of informal activities. And we have a lack of access of, uh, uh, of uh, policies that acknowledge public space as a site for livelihood activities because we have this cleaning, these ideas of uh, northern cities, and we have uh, a lack of basic infrastructure and transport services at workplaces and the bid for public contracts, it's not really uh, 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 accessible for informal workers. So overall, there is a lack of legal recognition and rights to representation. Next slide, please. So it is important that we changes narrative and we change our mindsets because there is another economy out there and this economy it's massive uh, yet disparaged it's often feared and it is global and we it is the way most of the world survives today. And it's still, we ignore economists, politicians, a business, ignore the informal workforce. Next slide, please. But uh, some uh, inclusive cities, uh, some policies are being pursued and implemented, even if it's not widespread. And we have a uh, few examples where we have uh, some policies towards protection, like uh, protection for home-based workers, uh, recognizing housing rights as their home. And this is very important because uh, you need to have mixed use zoning regulations that allow Allows, uh, allow these workers to perform their work in the, in the residential areas. We have a few examples uh, of legal rights to secure vending sites in good location for street vendors and even uh, experience like in Durban where markets have been built for informal workers. We have some examples, the cities like mine here in Brazil, 
Bogota in Colombia, Pune in uh, India, in which waste pickers have been given legal right to access waste and to bid for solid waste management. Overall, these workers, what they need is legal identity as legitimate workers and as uh, uh, legitimate economic agents and legal recognition of their organizations to be uh, to have the right to represent them in in bargaining uh, in negotiations and uh, the need for social protection. Uh, so we need promotion with basic infrastructure services for workers, basic infrastructure services for vendors, uh, infrastructure services for waste pickers, such as sorting and store sheds and uh, uh, machinery, and financial and business development and training services and the rights to affordable public transport. Next slide, please. And we need to have an understanding that this mantra that is very, is, is out there, most agencies and people speak about formalizing the informal. We cannot uh, uh, pursue formalization per se. We need to frame uh, a grassroots uh, a framework for formalization in which we, create incentives for informal enterprises to formalize. We create incentives to hire workers with standard contracts. Uh, we support the working pool with protection to reduce risks. We promote uh, policies that can uh, increase their assets and earnings, and we increase participation at the planning uh, at the at the planning table, promoting representative voices in relevant policy making and rule setting. Next slide, please. So, in conclusion, the informal economy is, in many cases, the source of employment for a vast majority of the urban poor including rural to urban migrants who settle in a city looking for economic opportunity. Next slide, please. And it makes sense that we think of economy as in a concept that it's, it's, it is of a hybrid and fair economy in which we give visibility and recognition of informal workers and we implement policies that can secure their livelihoods. I thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share our understanding of the informal economy. And I'm really looking forward to learning from uh, others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. It was a pleasure to have someone with your experience and, and from your organization talking today. Um, it was a really good point to start to understand how the economy in the informal economy works. So now we'll give the word to Rosa Codina, that is a researcher and senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University. Um, well, here you see her large um, CV and bio, and bio, but what Sonia will explain today, it's related to the informal economy, but more focus on tourism. That's one of the sectors that we are concerned about. So thank you, Rosa, for giving us your time. Um, I know that you will have to leave the, this space at three o'clock. So you have 15 minutes now and we will listen to you carefully. Thank you very much for attending. So uh, welcome everybody. So um, today I'm going to present the results or the findings of a study we, um, I did together with uh, Dr. Daniela Moreno Larcón. We did this last year uh, between the months of uh, January and February, uh, looking at the impacts of the pandemic specifically on women working in the informal tourism sector in Peru and Chile. Um, so this was a small project that was funded by the PEC, the UK Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center, and also by the British Council. And it was part of a wider remit um, that examined the links between the creative industries and the informal sector in the global south. So I was part of around uh, nine researchers around the world looking at 
uh, the creative industries and the informal sector. And our project specifically focused on tourism uh, and women working in the informal sector. Um, aside from looking at the impacts of the pandemic, we tried to also understand or to establish an initial understanding because this was a, a, a small project uh, to understand the underlying motivations and conditions for women's participation in the informal sector and also um, the way in which the pandemic affected their livelihoods um, and the type of uh, also uh, government intervention uh, that was offered to them and, and how easy or difficult uh, it was for them to access any help. Um, so because at the time uh, we were in uh, lockdown, both in the UK and in Spain, um, I'm based in the UK, uh, Dr. Daniela Larcon is based in uh, Spain. We did the, the uh, interviews virtually. So we had around eight participants in Peru and around five participants in Chile. Um, most of the women that we interviewed were artisan, uh, or craft makers working in the informal tourism sector. Uh, we also interviewed people from uh, the government, specifically working with the cultural and tourism industries, um, NGO managers, um, and as well as people working in the private tourism sector, dealing with uh, the uh, participants uh, who work uh, in tourism informally. Um, so just to establish a little bit uh, of, of what we know so far in terms of existing research around tourism and the informal economy. Uh, there's very little information. Um, a lot of the studies tend to uh, focus on the formal sector, uh, specifically also government data. Um, we know this because most of the time uh, the, the government obviously works with uh, uh, the formal sector. Um, and there's also very limited uh, disaggregated data, uh, sex disaggregated data. So, we know that in Peru, uh, a large sector of the, a, a large part of the tourism sector is made up by women, but we don't know much about these women. Um, you know, the characteristics, uh, age, ethnicity, uh, etc. Um, we know that most of the women work in uh, usually accommodation, uh, street vending, uh, handicraft production. Um, a lot of the roles typically mirror or extend uh, women's domestic work. So some of these women might uh, work partly from home, especially um, some of the handicraft makers that we interviewed. Um, they, they were working part time making handicrafts at home or they work maybe in family owned accommodation um, or um, they can also, uh, especially in Peru, they work in street selling, sometimes posing for uh, uh, tourist photographs, for instance. Um, and also what we we established in the studies that um, according to, the, there are different definitions obviously of, of the informal economy, but it's, it's very difficult, uh, as Sonia said, uh, in, uh, in countries in the global south to establish a difference between formal and informal sector because they're really interlinked. So you might have women who uh, you know, work in street selling perhaps, but they also work part-time in the formal sector. So they might work as, as, as for instance, maids, uh, in hotels, or you might have businesses that are established as formal businesses, but they employ uh, uh, people uh, informally, so they don't have any formal contract with them, or they might sell goods uh, or handicraft that are made in informal uh, uh, workshops, for instance. 70% um, of the economy in Peru is informal, so it's it's part of most of the economy. Uh, and in one way or another, uh, a lot of tourism businesses are, are part of, of both informal and formal sector. So in terms of the findings uh, regarding motivations for joining and staying in the informal uh, tourism sector, um, one of the issues that we found was that even though there were structural conditions that push women to uh, join the informal sector uh, because of a scarcity of employment options, especially in rural areas, um, for some of them, it was also a rational financial choice uh, especially women that we interviewed that worked in Pisac in Peru. Uh, Pisac is a town in the near Cusco, situated in the Sacred Valley, uh, where most of the economy is based uh, in tourism. It's, it's a mature tourism destination. So most of these women had been working most of their life uh, in tourism. Um, and some of the reasons that they mentioned uh, working uh, in, in the informal tourism sector was that uh, they were able to choose how many hours they work, so flexible working hours, which again, was something that they mentioned helped them uh, still meet some of the domestic chores that uh, because of 
you know, patriarchal expectations also uh, is still uh, something that that women are expected to take care of uh, the children and, and meet uh, domestic responsibilities. A lot of these women, for instance, work in the in the handicraft market. So they decide when they sell how many hours they, they work, they can take their children also with them. Um, it afforded them in this sense some, some independence uh, and freedom, and it had low entry barriers. Okay, uh, so, so for some of these women who maybe didn't finish formal education, um, who didn't have access, easy access to credit, that was a, something also that we found that they, they, they uh, faced many barriers when trying to access formal credit from uh, banks and other institutions. Um, so it was, um, you know, a way to establish their business uh, where they didn't have to maybe have too much uh, uh, capital. Uh, and so um, it was something that they could do uh, more easily than maybe work in the formal sector. Um, in the case of Chile, also, one of the main motivations for joining the informal tourism economy uh, was not only to supplement household income, uh, but it was also to promote indigenous culture. It was something that was seen by the women as a uh, women's responsibility, whilst indigenous men favored work in the construction sector. There, so there was an element also of um, wanting to promote uh, indigenous uh, heritage for uh, the indigenous women that, that worked uh, in the informal tourism sector. Um, we also looked at you know, some of the barriers that women faced to uh, join to, or to formalize um, so one of the barriers was that we found that it was difficult to, uh, for them also to access uh, governmental information on the processes to formalize. They didn't see a lot of benefits. Uh, mostly they saw a lot of costs, complicated uh, bureaucratic processes, quite long, a lot of the times uh, bureaucratic processes. For a lot of the women uh, living in uh, rural zones, it involved long trips to urban areas. Um, you know, it involves uh, expenses also in terms of having to uh, hire people to help them with that. Uh, and um, they didn't really see a lot of benefits in terms of what they would get in return, especially because uh, a lot of them work part time. Uh, the, the returns that they have on a monthly basis uh, are not always the same. So they would see most of the, the 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 impacts of joining the formal sector in terms of paying taxes licenses etc uh, eating into their profit uh, so there was a lack of perceived uh, benefits um there was also we found that uh, especially uh, for women uh, working in less mature tourism destinations that uh, work in rural destinations part-time there was also a lot of uh, discouraging in that uh, with tacit commentary sometimes from uh, male family members uh, and also uh, 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 at a local governmental level uh, telling them you know this is maybe not something that you want to do why don't you take care of your children you know why don't you uh, take care of your home you're not you know it's too complicated for youth uh, that was something that was mentioned a lot of the times um, and they faced also um, intersectional discrimination especially indigenous women so in the sense that uh, they face uh, sometimes barriers of discrimination, not just because they're women, but because they are indigenous women, because they also are part of a rural community. So that, you know, the different categories there kind of in, in, interlinking. Um, so it was, it was especially more complicated for indigenous women uh, to be able to access credits. And, and um, a lot of the times also uh, to be able to uh, uh, be included uh, in, in uh, 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 maybe tourism uh, funded, uh, uh, sorry, governmental funded uh, projects for community-based tourism, for instance. Um, in the case of Chile in particular, um, what we found was that uh, the tourism certification standards were difficult to meet and they appeared to compromise indigenous cultural heritage. So for instance, uh, if the women wanted to cook in the traditional rukas, which is a, a traditional hut for indigenous Mapuche women. Uh, if they wanted to cook there for tourists, they couldn't because the floor had to be made of a special material, which uh, they couldn't meet because it's a, it's a traditional hut. Uh, so they, they couldn't get the license, for instance, or some of the materials that they, they uh, use uh, for handicrafts, again, did not meet uh, the, the certification standard. So the certification standards were not really flexible in terms of trying to understand or, or to uh, uh, co collaborate 
uh, with uh, uh, indigenous culture. In Chile also, there was a fear uh, that if they joined um, the, the, if they joined the formal sector, they would lose some of the benefits uh, from uh, the state um, in terms of help, uh, because uh, you know they would be seen to maybe have money. Uh, so they would lose some of the state benefits from uh, joining the, the formal sector. And again, they thought that uh, they would lose profits because of high tax costs. Um, so these are some of the quotes from the, uh, the interviews that we did. Um, so you can see uh, from the first quote, uh, Gabi, an NGO manager working with uh, Peruvian women, uh, mentioning the, the, the high costs associated with uh, joining the formal sector. Um, again, uh, a comment here about the, the tacit discouragement that they can sometimes face from uh, male uh, counterparts in the community. And the last one is from Chile, uh, Teresa, a female artist and trainer, uh, talking about the fact, again, that if they become formal, they become visible in the tax system and uh, that they fear that then they might lose some of the, the help that they get uh, from the state. Uh, in terms of the pandemic, um, at the time, I have to say before I say this, that when I did the interviews as well with governmental stakeholders and I asked them whether there were at any point, uh, any programs that were targeted for women working in tourism, um, they mentioned that th they weren't really, they hadn't in all the, the 20 years, this particular uh, uh, stakeholder mentioned, uh, in, in all his 20 years working in the Ministry of Tourism, there hadn't been one specific policy uh, targeting uh, women. Um, and also uh, nothing in terms of the informal sector. So that, you know, that help in terms of policy uh, wasn't, wasn't there to begin with. But with the pandemic, also the Peruvian state didn't really provide any targeted financial assistance or programs for informal enterprises. Um, they did provide two economic aid bonuses targeted at families living below the poverty threshold. Uh, so emergency food bundles and conditional cash transfers. Um, informal actors were excluded from state uh, programs. What I found was um, from some of the interview quotes that it was also a, in a way a tacit mechanism to, in, to, to, to punish them for being informal and to encourage them to formalize. Um, and it wasn't really seen as a crisis at the as a crisis uh, for informal, especially people working in the tourism sector, especially in areas of Peru that rely on international uh, tourists that they couldn't really uh, work for many months because the borders were completely shut and we were in lock uh, Peru was in lockdown for a long time, complete lockdown. Um, so it wasn't really seen as, as, as a crisis that you know required uh, immediate help, but uh, they they saw it somewhat as a way to, you know, as a, as a punitive mechanism to force them or to, to make them reconsider uh, the, 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 the benefits of, of, of formalizing. Um, so you had some lending and funding programs that were implemented for the tourism and handicraft industries. Uh, but again, these were mostly directed towards formal tourism related enterprises. Um, so uh, some of the criteria, for instance, included that you had to have uh, a, a selling license that had had to be active for I think one or two years before the pandemic, and you also needed to show a certain level of sales, which for a lot of small uh, enterprises, especially women that maybe is just working uh, for themselves, uh, they have low levels of sales, so it was it was difficult to present that evidence. Um, also, a lot of times women had to cope with significant increase in domestic responsibilities, so they were the main uh, uh, um, ones in the home taking care of sick and elderly family members. Also, uh, they were responsible for a lot of the uh, initiatives to feed uh, the community at a local level, like soup kitchens, for instance. So that took also, that put a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, psychological pressure on them, but also took away uh, any time that they could have also to uh, you know, um, spend on their, uh, uh, on their business. Um, so what also we found with some of the women working in more mature tourism destinations is that they were able to use some of the transferable skills that they learned during the time working in informal tourism. Um, and that included adaptability to uh, changing conditions, uh, negotiation and sales skills, uh, entrepreneurial vision. Um, so some women mentioned, for instance, that um, they knew that they weren't going to be able to work 
uh, in tourism uh, for you know many months. So they look for other opportunities in terms of uh, selling. So some of them, for instance, in peace, I mentioned in that they saw that people were consuming more alcohol during the pandemic. So they they opened their own uh, liquor store from home. Uh, you know they bought chickens and then they made chicken soup and and sold it to family and friends. So they were always kind of looking for ways for the next opportunity, uh, observing what was going on during the pandemic um, and, and, and trying to, in a way, adapt to uh, what was happening. Um, especially, all, again, women from PISAC emphasized that they were driven to find alternative ways to earn income outside of tourism because uh, they had become accustomed to being the main winners or to have the, the the, the main breadwinners so to have financial independence and they didn't want to ask uh, husbands for uh, money. Uh, for the rest of interviewed women in other regions of Peru that came from less uh, tourism uh, centered economies, the degree of adaptation was different. For a lot of those women, they stopped working altogether. They went back to cultivating the land, um, but it also stopped uh, uh, the so sole source of revenue that they had for themselves, particularly uh, in terms of um, selling their products uh, through uh, handicraft trade shows known as ferias. Um, and it also stopped a lot of NGO contracts that they had uh, to sell their products. Um, and what we found was that there was also uh, a dependency on intermediaries to sell uh, their handicraft and their textiles. So it, it highlighted this over-dependence and also the fact that there was a lot of lack of digital literacy um, a lot of the artisans are usually older, in their 50s. They come from rural areas, so they've got, in, in any case, poor access to digital infrastructure. They don't know how to necessarily use it to market and sell their products. Um, so with that, you know, with, uh, with the pandemic coming and the lockdown um, and uh, being at home also, it meant that um, they didn't have those opportunities to connect with other women uh, and uh, build networks outside of their households and communities. Um, and the ferias especially provided that for women. And we saw the same thing happen in uh, Chile as well um, in terms of the ferias, which again was, was a, a, an important event for uh, female handicraft sellers. Um, it also affected the women's ability to buy raw materials because they had to go uh, to uh, to uh, urban centers to buy materials for handicraft, and that was difficult during the pandemic with the lockdown. And they again mentioned women mentioned that they had problems in access and financial aid provided by the government because they had to travel to urban centers. Um, and uh, again, some of the the programs were not designed for people in the informal economy because you had to have a bank account, etc. Um, so again, we saw that most relief aid and funding schemes were largely directed at uh, formal, formal actors. Um, and there was also a feeling amongst uh, some of the women that we interviewed that the pandemic was going to aggravate the issue of certifications because, uh, because of the sanitary concerns uh, uh, that the, the pandemic created in terms of uh, trying to meet uh, hygiene standards, that the standards uh, in terms of obtaining tourist certification were going to become even more difficult to meet after the pandemic. Um, so to conclude, one of the, the, the issues that we saw was the need for increased feasibility uh, in the conditions to be met formalization. Um, and we really need to involve people at the local level also in uh, trying to uh, create mechanisms, policies, uh, uh, to see how some of the, 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 the uh, mechanisms can be adapted for people working in the informal tourism sector where you have also, uh, you don't have constant revenue every month. Um, we could have maybe a simplification of some of the conditions to be met to obtain certifications, especially in the case of Chile, uh, more help uh, from the state, especially with bureaucratic processes, more transparent actions to formalization, access to formalization guidelines, maybe discounted tax rates to account for tourism, highly seasonal earnings. Um, we need to have more information about the women working in the informal sector. Um, and we need to incorporate that into wider policy development and assistance mechanism. Um, and especially during the, the pandemic, which we're still li really living uh, still uh, in, in a pandemic, short and medium direct financial state assistance is especially needed. Um, for informal tourism workers whose livelihoods really rely uh, on tourism and 
again, because of the, the, the issues in terms of lockdown and, and borders closing and opening, uh, it's, it's difficult, especially for, for, for people relying on international tourism. Um, we found that uh, to some degree, informal tourism may empower women in terms of giving them access to uh, uh, work and uh, uh, maybe developing some transferable skills and financial capital, but it can also create over-dependence on intermediaries uh, and it can limit the access to formal trade protection. And this is something that was really difficult during the pandemic uh, because they, they found a lot of the women working in the informal tourism sector found that they had absolutely no state protection. Um, and finally, gender equality should be integrated in the design implementation of any sort of tourism measure or policy. So like I mentioned before, there wasn't really a gender consideration in terms of um, trying to understand what policies could be developed to meet the needs of, of women in the informal tourism sector in Peru or, or just women working in, in, in tourism to account for some of the, the challenges and barriers that they face. Um, and for gender responsive policies further, we need especially sex disaggregated data on the nature of female employment in tourism uh, and the informal sector. It was very, very interesting. Thank you, Rosa, for, for your time. So now we are traveling from Peru to, and Chile to, to Asia, to, to Nepal, because now it's the turn to, of Luki Chentry, that she's a, the executive director of Three Sisters Adventure Trekking, and also it's part from the different organizations that you can see on the screen. Namaste, uh, except for my greetings from Nepal. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm representing Three Sister Adventure Trekking Company, and it is a company, it is a pioneer company in the field of trained women uh, trekking guide services in the Himalayas. And it has been started in 1994, and we Three Sister has been chosen this uh, like, industry by the time when uh, like tourism was booming in Nepal. And and uh, uh, as you know, to, uh, Nepal is a landlocked country with the Himalayas in the northern border. The mountains are the main source of economy for the adventure tourism, like trekking, rafting, and mountaineering. In Nepal, we experience four seasons. Spring and autumn are considered as the best uh, trekking season our tourism season. And uh, that's why it's called a uh, tourism called a uh, seasonal sector. It provides varieties of em uh, employment opportunities for both skilled and unskilled uh, people. They work during the season to make cash and go back to their village during the slow season in monsoon and winter. Tourism is creating both permanent and seasonal jobs. According to the Central Bureau of Statistics, Nepal's tourism industry supplies 371,000 jobs. It represents 11.5% of the country's total population. In Nepal, 52% populations are women. And tourism is one of one of the largest service sector engaging women, employment and small businesses. They can contribute both to direct and indirect tourism sector, farming, rural tourism, tea houses, homestay, to the hospitality profession. And tourism is the informal sector, but it has been playing a vital role to create job and enterprises. It is an easily accessible sector. As we all know, informal means poor social security and is illegal, although tourism enterprises are in most developing countries like in Nepal, is providing the most decent employment opportunities for the local people. It also creates many business opportunities. Tourism is a vast sector. It influences the many areas of the destinations like socio, 
the economy, employment opportunities, art, culture, and history, education, and infrastructure development, and humanitarian activities. However, women are in living behind all these opportunities because of their responsibilities, the social norms and values, and the traditional practices. Besides those women lack education and opportunities, they can even enter this sector easily. And uh, tourism is the informal sector, but it has been playing, it has been playing a vital role to create a job and enterprises. It is an easily accessible sector. As we all know, informal means poor social security and is, sorry, uh, I already told that, sorry. Why we are working on women and why women in tourism is women are, by nature, they are humble, responsible, caretakers and passion and are the qualities required in the service industry. So the additional skills and knowledge will equip well women to work in this sector. It will be a great employment opportunities within the country. Every day on average, over thousand Nepalese young people are leaving the country for seeking employment in the Middle East country while the life threatening accidents are becoming common. Still, the youth are taking risks in their life in the hope of a better future. On the other hand, tourism had a huge gender gap due to patriarchal traditions. Nowadays, women are encouraged to engage themselves in the tourism profession and enterprise. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our company uh, because uh, how it become a global interested organization. Our social enterprise, Three Sister Adventure Trekking Company and our nonprofit Empowering Women of Nepal, together it is a uh, social enterprise. So our social enterprise is working together to train women to become trekking guides. But this does not limit them with their gaining knowledge and opportunity to explore many things around and within themselves. They are learning skill to be a leader and be self-supporting, independent and decision-making women. Our continuous effort to become uh, provide training and paid apprenticeship program plus employment is the good action for equal work or equal work rights for women and economic empowerment. Women are getting the necessary skill and knowledge in their training to protect themselves from natural and physical hazard. They are not only learning about first aid and other protection, but learning about challenging discrimination. They are now known for their potential ab abilities, strength, and interest to deal their life. The result of our action is going to create a women-friendly atmosphere to uh, work and travel trekking, hassle-free trekking, and also employment opportunities for the women and gender equality in the tourism job, uh, market, tourism job market. There are lots, lots of huge impacts in our work is going on and I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our theory of change, like tourism and women. In 1994, when we started this uh, organization, this service, it was a funny story for the local people here. But now when we go through this theory of changes, it shows that our initiation aligned our work to the UN Women Empowerment Principles. Like there are seven principles, I think you may know, establish high level corporate leadership for gender equality, 
and treat all people fairly at work, respect and support human rights and non-discrimination, ensure the health, safety, and well-being of all women and men workers, promote education, training, and professional development for women, implement enterprise development, supply chains, and marketing practices that empower women, and promote equality through community initiative and advocacy, measure and publicly report on progress on achieve gender equality. These are the seven principles that UN has, and it has, we have been aligned on it. And however, we, our organization has also five E principle to empower women. And first one is environment. We are working in the mountain. The these days mountain environment is really fragile. So the mountain areas are in the trade of global warming. And we should be careful and take care of our mountains. On the other hand, we are creating women-friendly atmosphere for Nepalese women to enter into this industry because this is a totally new area. So we have to encourage women to come into this industry. So second E was, is, is education. All our training is education because we are providing all the uh, knowledge and skill so women can start their job in this industry. And exploration, after the training program, women will go on the job tra uh, training. So during that time, they will get chance to explore their own country and other side, they will know their own capacity and their interest and their passion on this area. And after that, they will come back and they will tell us whether they will continue this job or not. So they will get the employment. They will continue their job. And these, the, at the end, they develop their career and build confidence. They will become a professional guide and financially independent to be empowered. This is how they will complete the 5E principle to be empowered. And what we do, what are the different things we do is we do our female tracking guide training program. Beside that, we also provided them ice climbing, rock climbing kind of program that will also support them to, be, uh, to find out their own abilities. And also we have some other young women empowerment program through sports and STEM. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that program. And also we have the women initiation ecotourism program in the remote areas to support rural women to, uh, on their uh, like economic development. So <clears throat> these all, these all things are uh, like how we are doing and uh, the impacts of these all work are the traditional taboo of the masculine profession stigma has been broken now because it has become a common sight to have the women trekking guide in the Himalayas these days. And it helps to build trust in women's ability and thousands of women enroll in the training and hundreds of women are working and developing their career and many of them started their own businesses. And gender balance in the tourism job market and entrepreneur opportunities to start their own business in this sector. It has narrowed down the gender disparity in the tourism job market all these actions are aligned with the UN Sustainable Development. These are the few photos I want to share with you. Okay, a few glimpse of photos that our training and trekking in the Himalayas, you may enjoy seeing this, our, our training program. So after that, the COVID is, we already hear a little bit about the COVID, and in uh, during like uh, in Nepal tourism was booming very fast, very well, but all of a sudden in uh, 
2020, tourism was hit by COVID and, and it has been affected all over the world, not only in Nepal, but Nepal is now facing foreign currencies crisis a lot. And the remittance and tourism are one of the main uh, importers of foreign currencies in Nepal. It helps to balance the import and export trade of the country. Until 2019, tourism was rapidly growing and our government was ambitious and campaigned Visit Nepal 2020 to host 2 million tourists and expected $2 billion income and thousands of new jobs. And but COVID-19-19 affected badly all over the world. All remittance and tourism went down and unemployment and health crisis were high in the country. Mostly immigrant workers from rural areas to the urban were suffering the most. We heard that before also. Most tourism professional and entrepreneurs decided to think about alternative income resource, uh, sources. And beside that, many people had a challenging time dealing with the COVID situation. They were traumatized, afraid, shocked, and went into the depression while some committed suicide as well. Due to COVID, everything is more limited uh, to remote than physical activities to encourage, uh, it encourages developing, developing and depending on technology. Most tourism professional went back to their home to support traditional farming. Originally, women were left behind in the village to take care of their children and farms. Many farmers from the rural areas were migrating urban areas, India and other Gulf countries as unskilled labor. All the fertile lands were unproductive, but now many villagers are back in their village and have started farming again. So, now the COVID situation is improving and tourism is picking up slowly. All tourism workers are returning back to their jobs again. So we are optimistic for the recovery of the COVID situation all over the world by next year, 2023. And we look forward to see you in Nepal and we welcome you in Nepal. And, and looking forward to see you and welcome you in Nepal. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share our experiences. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, Luki. Um, if, okay, now, now I see you clearly. Okay, so now we have um, a little bit of time to share, to ask our panelists. If we have some questions or anything we want to share with the audience, now it's your turn. So you can just um, raise your hand or just open your mic and and ask to to our speakers today. Uh, Rosa has to had to leave. She already told it um, in the chat. So we just have Sonia and Lucky, but I'm sure that they will answer perfectly your questions or your thoughts. So I think that um, Ernest raised his hand and Angie too. So Ernest, if you want to start and then we keep going. Okay. Muchas gracias. Voy a hablar en español. Creo que pueden activar su traducción si alguien no me entiende. Quería hacerle una pregunta a Sonia. Y primero que todo agradecerle su intervención, que me pareció extraordinariamente interesante. Y quería preguntarle por la dimensión de organización de las trabajadoras y los trabajadores del sector informal. Creo que hay una rica tradición organizativa en distintos sectores de actividad, tanto para generar actividad económica como también como mecanismo de protección. Querría preguntarte qué podemos aprender de estos procesos organizativos de trabajadores y trabajadoras del sector informal 
Y relacionado con esto, cuando hablamos de turismo y trabajo informal, normalmente se nos viene a la cabeza fundamentalmente el trabajo de personas que venden de forma ambulante. Um, ¿Qué procesos organizativos existen en este ámbito y hacia qué otros aspectos, de, ámbitos, deberíamos dirigir nuestra mirada cuando hablamos de trabajo informal y turismo? Muchas gracias. Uh, gracias por tu pregunta. Voy a contestar en uh, inglés. Uh, Thank you very much for your question. Uh, yeah, uh, different sectors of the informal economy have been uh, uh, involved in different processes of organizing. I, the, the process that I follow more closely is uh, the one related to a speakers because this is my, I am a sector specialist in, uh, in way speakers, but uh, Uh, we have uh, different uh, international organizations now, something that uh, we didn't have, uh, let's say, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, if we talk about uh, uh, street vendors, which I think may be more, you know, there is a kind of a connection, a more direct connection between informal tourist workers from what I'm, I've been hearing from the presentation and street vendors. Uh, we, uh, we have now the uh, Federation, the International Federation of uh, Street Vendors, Street Nets. They uh, are now based in Ukraine, but uh, the emergency of Street Net uh draws from intense organizing work done in south africa and south africa was the, the kind of uh, the house where where the the secretariat of uh, street net had was based for quite some time and now it is in ukraine and they they have a strong uh uh federation which no nucleates different Uh, different uh, country uh, organizations. Uh, here in, in Brazil, for instance, we have uh, uh, the, the Association of Street Vendors at the national level, which is uh, a part of the street net, and we have different organizations. In the, uh, in, in the way speakers, we, we don't have a formal global uh, uh, alliance of way speakers. We have an informal one. It's like a networking process, which has been in place since, to, since 2008. And we have very strong movements, uh, <clears throat> very strong movements, particularly here in Latin America, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina. Chile, uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, and they nucleated themselves into a uh, Latin American network of way speakers and together with other groups that are beginning to be organized in, in the waste uh, picking sector in India, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in Africa. <laughs> different countries in, in, in Africa, they are in this process of forming a global alliance of uh, way speakers, global right. If I, you know, it's a very broad question and we would have to get into details for each sector, but overall, if I can, you know, uh, give an, an answer on that, I think it's important to have at least from the experience that we have uh, supporting these networks, uh, street nets, global rec, we see the role of uh, documentation and research being framed, you know, sound, consistent research, but being framed in, 
in products, in formats that can really be useful for the workers. And we have our, uh, one of WIGO founders and the founder of SEWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, which represents 1.5 million people in India, Ilabat, saying that how important it was to have statistics in format that workers could go to the government and negotiate uh, their demands based on, on research and statistics that were useful. So one thing that I, I would raise is uh, the relevance of documentation research, but in a format that is user-friendly for the workers that they can understand and really embrace that data, you know. And we can see that here in Brazil, the work that we did with the way speakers mapping health risks in cooperatives uh, in my geography here where I live, uh, uh, many associations of way speakers have told us that they have gone to, to their local government and used that data to negotiate their demands. So this is one issue. The other thing is the role of what we call it the organizers. Uh, uh, organizing doesn't is you know doesn't uh, emerge in itself. Usually, it needs some catalyzing work, and finding organizations that can support workers on the ground to form their initial, be it a cooperative association or whatever format, uh, um, workers in a given context decide to organize themselves. It's very important because uh, you know you need uh, you need some support because organizing is it it, it means you have to it, it's it's a long term process you know and so to stay on very only two key things I would uh, favor these two you know. Thank you, Sonia. I saw that Anje also raised her hand earlier on. Yeah, you can ask. Yeah, now. thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, intensive insights and uh, this different perspectives that you are having, Sonia, looking more in urban context, looking, uh, looking more in a, in a rural context. Um, what we see in the development of tourism, I think uh, in COVID and in a post-COVID scenario, if you already want to call it uh, that way, um, we see, an, I think there will be an increase in rural tourism, which might be of benefit for um, rural tourism initiatives. Um, so I'm uh, asking Lucky if you see that uh, there are some improvements in the way that uh, in rural communities um, people can organize themselves from the informal um, to a more to 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 a situation with uh, better security. Um, also reflecting maybe a little bit on the lessons or the the experience of the last two years, which were horrible, as you explained also from Nepal. And maybe afterwards, one question to Sonia. At the same time, we see through the increasing trends of digitalization, we see new business models of uh, digital platforms, um, being a booking platforms or whatsoever in the formal economy. But the people who are working in this sector are basically left in the informal economy. So the precariousness of people who are working and kind of employed in, in this um, new business models, um, they are staying in the informal sector, but the companies are formal. So maybe I'm not sure if, but maybe you can say something about this. Sorry that I'm uh, having two questions at the same time with very different backgrounds, but maybe Lucky first. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just one, uh, one, okay. one thing before. Um, we are running out of time. We still we just have 10 minutes left. So I okay. will ask Yuki and Sonia to be as brief mm -hmm. as it's possible. I know we, questions are difficult and we could be talking by hours, but, but just to finish on time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Angie. Yeah, it is a good question because uh, uh, because of this COVID, we have been learning so much because uh, tourism is quite delicate business. We it can be affected by anything, and we have to be very careful. And um, and now it has been uh, taught us that uh, we have to be careful, and also we have uh, uh, like a sanitized. Uh, sanit um, uh, sanitary like um sanitations and many things like we have to be very careful although we were very uh, careful on those things uh, still uh, now uh, it had taught us so much about this and um, uh, many people they are uh, restructuring their uh, like um um, um uh, accessories uh, because um, it has to be and uh, and uh, this is so many things that people they have learned like uh, even the alternative um, you know business or alternative uh, um, uh, profession or something like that and people they are learning uh, like um, alternative uh, skill they are learning uh, and uh, so many things like uh, it is something like not only the trade but there are so many lesson it has left to the people, uh, so so like people, they are uh, now uh, doing uh, improving their facilities. Yeah, thank you. And we are very much optimistic that in future it will be better again. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so very quickly, uh, this has been you know Uberization has been one of our concerns. You know, uh, digital platforms, startups, and. Uh, most uh, workers organizations that we are connected with have been reporting these as a threat. Still, we haven't done serious research on, on this trend. Uh, it's there, we can hear what uh, some uh, workers are saying. We have been following here in my geography in Brazil, we have been following an experience which is a more worker led, although a, a, a platform, it's a, a, it's an app to connect uh, workers and cooperative uh, waste pickers and cooperatives of waste pickers to waste producers. It's called the Kataki app. And although it, it was created by an NGO, but it's an NGO with very close connections with the workers on the ground. And uh, we are working with them around having that governance system of the app in ways that are really uh, uh, aligned with having workers representation in the governance structure of this app. So yeah, uh, it, it's a threat. And I think it's more a threat than an opportunity, even though those who are advocating for it present it as, you know, as a wonderful tool. But we know that the poorest of the poor uh, cannot keep up with all these uh, different technologies. And uh, for me, I see it more as a threat. Okay, Sonia, thank you and lucky too for your answers. Um, I'm afraid that we have to start finishing this webinar today, but before I close the session, I can give you one minute to each of you if you want to add something or, or just say something to close if you have something that you haven't said yet and you want to say it before finishing. Hello. So Oh. Alles gut und bei euch? Prima. Was geht es hier heute? Oui. Well, there was an. an, an <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I don't understand German, so. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sonia, go go ahead. Yes, I, I, I really appreciated this space for sharing, but also. Uh, for learning, uh, you know, I learned immensely. Uh, we, I don't have any expertise on this sector, but we are happy to contribute 
with whatever uh, studies we have from other uh, sector groups that you guys may find it useful. So feel free to reach out on our email, which I'll pop here in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. We will do it for sure. It was a pleasure to have you here. Lucky, do you want to add something else? Uh, thank you once again, uh, like uh, giving this uh, floor to share our work. And, uh, you know, and uh, as uh, Sonia said, like uh, uh, I also learned so much uh, from uh, two presenters. And uh, I'm sure that uh, this kind of knowledge sharing will help other people plus for us also uh, to exchange ideas between us. And so, and also for, um, thank you so much for the organizer and uh, giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Kat. Thank you. Well, so now I just want to tell you that you can visit our website to know more about transforming tourism. Also, you can share what we have been talking today through your social media. Just um, share this content of today because it was very interesting. And I just want to remember that um, you are all invited to participate in the next seminar that it's taking place the 6th of May, that we will continue talking about the informal sector, but this, this time more in the perspective of the self-organization of informal work. We will have the testimonies of different workers from all over the world. So we will be very happy to see you again there, 6th of May, the same timetable. We will give more information next week. And yeah, it was a pleasure to have you all and see you very, very soon. Thank you.